Thanks for tuning in for this message from Momentum Church. We invite you to subscribe to this feed to receive a steady stream of encouragement, inspiration and wisdom from God's Word. How wonderful to be in God's presence this morning. And I just would like to pray first, just before we start. Lord God, I just pray. I pray, Lord God, that your word would be alive in my mouth. I pray for your love and your mercy and grace and your compassion on us would come through this word. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. So online, I follow a Jewish family. They're an Orthodox, um, Chaisidic Orthodox family. It's a rabbi and his wife. They're only very young. They have two young children. Um, The rabbi wears a hat, it's like a fedora, so it's not like the typical hats that you see when you see the Jewish people, Um, but he doesn't have the ringlets. And his wife wears a wig, which she started to wear when she was married because she believes that her husband should be the only one who sees the glory of her hair. So they do vlogs, they do videos, and they do videos about different interesting things in their orthodox Jewish life and I find that quite fascinating and the most recent video that I watched was a video about a mikvah. Now a mikvah is a Jewish Jewish purity bath so both men and women will need to use a mikvah at certain times and you will find there will be in every Jewish community a male and a female mikvah. Now, in this particular video, she was taking us through the mikvah and explaining why a woman would need to have a mikvah. And one of the reasons why a woman would need to have a mikvah is when she's been in a state of nida. Now, a state of nida is when a woman is in her monthly cycle. And for during that period of time, she cannot be touched by other people in her household, she cannot touch other people and it's not good for them to touch her because that would make them unclean. So when she's in a state of nida, that means she's unclean. And that means that if she sits on the bed, she touches a chair, she sits on the chair, touches things in the kitchen that no one else should touch, then she can be spreading the uncleanliness to other people in her family. So the woman is very excited to go and have a mikvah because this state of nida lasts 14 days, which is two weeks in a month. Can you imagine that? So on the night when she starts, when she's set free, she goes into the mikvah and she has to be thoroughly cleansed in a prep room. So that means she has to have, her hair needs to be washed all knots need to be out of it. Her ears all have to be cleaned without wax in them. Her teeth and her mouth, everything has to be clean. Her toenails, all different parts of her body have to be totally clean before she enters the mikvah. Now the mikvah is like a spa bath. It's come from fresh living water. So it's rainwater that's been chlorinated. And in this particular mikvah, it's quite rich. It's in New York City. So she she's got her own bath. So when she's ready and she's cleaned in the prep room, then she goes out, she puts a robe around herself and she goes to the bath and then she gives the robe to the attendant and then she goes into the bath and she dunks down and all the water has to cover all of her body and all of her hair. And then when she's ready, she comes back up again and she recites the blessing. And the blessing is, blessing are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with your commandments and commanded us concerning the immersion. And so when she comes out, she says the blessing, and then the attendant gives her a towel to cover her head. She comes out, she puts the robe back on, then she goes into another room and gets a jug of water, of living water, and she pours it over her hands six times. And now she is clean and she is able to go back to her normal life. A lot of Orthodox Jews, well, probably the majority of them all, use twin beds. So when the woman is in the state of Nida, the twin beds are separated. When everything is clean again, 
then they bring their beds back together again. Now, the woman in the video admitted that this is a very hard thing to do. There is also another video where they explain if a woman is in nida after giving birth, and that will last six weeks. And then if she wants to pass the baby to her husband, she has to pass the baby through another person. So she just can't go over and here, darling, have the baby. She has to pass the baby to somebody else, usually a special nurse, and then she passes it to her husband. And that's the sort of life they live. This woman and this family and the people who live like this are suffering because they don't have free access to each other because they have not accepted the Lord and his invitation to them to have access to him. So why am I telling you all of this? I'm telling you all of this because of the woman with the issue of blood. I would like to read it from Mark 5, 25 to 4. Um, that's the um, most um, best version of it. It gives all the um, emotions behind it. I'm reading it in the Amplified. It should be up there. Terrific. Okay. A woman in the crowd had suffered from a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much suffering at the hands of many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but instead had become worse. She had heard reports about Jesus and she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his outer robe. For she thought, if I touch his clothing, I will get well. Immediately, her flow of blood was dried up and she felt in her body and knew without a doubt that she was healed of her suffering. Immediately, Jesus, recognising in himself the power that had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in around you? from all sides and you ask who touched me still he kept looking around to see the woman who had done it and the woman though she was afraid and trembling and aware of what had happened to her came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth and then he said to her daughter your faith personal trust and confidence in me has restored you to health. Go in peace and be permanently healed from your suffering. So this woman was in a state of nida, uncleanliness, for 12 years. So you can imagine the life that she lived and not only being suffering from the sickness, but also alienated from friends and families like a leper. So we're going to look at those first few verses when she was suffering from a hemorrhage and she endured much suffering. She had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but instead become worse. Okay, let's look at the law behind this. In Leviticus 15, 19, it says, when a woman has a discharge and the discharge in her body is blood, she shall be in her menstrual impurity for seven days. And whoever touches her shall be unclean until the evening. It goes on further and explains if you touch her bed, if you touch her seating, you will be made unclean. And then the man has to, or the person who's done it, has to go and wash their clothes and be clean again in the evening. So they're unclean again till the evening. And then we go down a bit further to 25 verses 25 to 30 in Leviticus 15. It now begins to talk about the woman in our story. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of discharge, she will continue in her uncleanness. As in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. But 
if she is cleansed of her discharge, she shall now count another seven days to make sure there's still no more blood. And after that, she shall be clean. And then on the eighth day, she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons and bring them to the priest, to the entrance of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall use one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her before the Lord for her unclean discharge. Now you might notice that in the, when it talks about normal um, menstrual impurity, it talks about seven days, not the 14 days, which I told you about in the story. The reason behind this is because after the temple was destroyed in AD 70, the rabbis took over in a much more a stronger way and they brought that commandment together. They wanted to make sure there was no one was doing the wrong thing. And so they made that a normal woman with a normal menstrual flow would now have to wait the full 14 days as the same as the one with the abnormal. Okay, that was to keep an eye on them. And that was an added law of man that Jesus often spoke about. Okay, so why, why did this law exist? This law was ceremonial and it was to do with worship. In Leviticus 15, 31, it says, You shall put the Israelites on guard against their impurity, lest they die through their impurity by defiling my tabernacle, which is among them. The temple sacrifices and the, temp and the priestly gifts all had to be guide guarded from ritual impurity. So ritual purification and sacrifice was required to allow people to eventually approach the sanctuary of God again, to have access to God, because contaminating the place where God dwells was a severe offense. And that's why they are guarding the people she touches or the things she touches, because they wanna make sure this impurity does not come into the tent of meeting or the temple. So this woman who's suffering has stepped out in faith and she's coming to find this Jesus. She had heard reports about Jesus. And what had she heard about him? We imagine she would have heard rumors. She would have heard stories about healings, about miracles, um, sickness healed, lots of things happening maybe she even heard him the story about how he preached to nazareth when he was in the in the synagogue and he said i've come to bring the gospel to the poor to heal the brokenhearted deliverance to the captive recovery of sight to the blind and set at liberty those who are oppressed in matthew 4 17 jesus came proclaiming repent for the kingdom of god is at hand it has drawn near he was saying stop thinking about god the way you've always thought about him i am bringing in a new way every miracle every healing every deliverance every wonder of jesus revealed god's glory and was a sign to israel that the messiah had come with an invitation to set them spiritually free and give them access to him through his death and resurrection. So Jesus, as he came healing and doing wonders and miracles, he was preemptively giving them a glimpse into the new way of the covenant and what it was going to look like to those who'd been under the weight of the law for so long. So, next verse. And she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his outer robe. Who was this Jesus she was reaching out to? In John 1, 14, it says, The word was made flesh and tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as only the begotten of the Father, 
full of grace and truth. Christ, in his human flesh, was God's tabernacle. It says, we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father. Spurgeon says, Jesus is not the tabernacle without the glory. The presence of God was living and walking among them. So what was the tabernacle? Why was there a tabernacle? In Exodus, in Exodus 25, 8, it was God who first expressed his desire to dwell among men, instructing Moses to tell the people to construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. In Leviticus 26, 1 to Sorry, Leviticus 26, 12, God says, And I will walk among you and will be your God, and you shall be my people. In Ezekiel 37, 26 to 27, it says, I will make my dwelling among them and will walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. In 2 Corinthians 6, 16 to 17, it says, What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. In Revelations 21, 3, it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne room saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He wants to be with us. That has been his heart cry from the very beginning. He wants to live with us, his presence with us, his presence in us. The word Shekinah comes from the root word Shaken, which means to dwell settle down, tabernacle with, to have a habitation with. And both are associated with the presence of God and his glory dwelling with man. The Hebrew word shana is connected to shakan and is translated as grace and favour and means to pitch a tent with. The tabernacle was a tent of meeting where men went to meet with God. And they could only do that through the sacrifice of certain animals. That is how man reconciled with God. But when God extends his grace and favour to you, it is though he is pitching his tent with you. This woman reached out to the tent of God. So what happens when a stranger reaches out to a tent in Middle Eastern Bible hospitality. In Middle Eastern hospitality, it's considered to be a sacred duty and it's, it's, it's open. It's like, you know, you, you know the word, where I'm hospitable to new ideas. The tent was meant to be open to the stranger who needed food or provision or help. And guests were believed to have been sent by God. There was a Middle Eastern proverb, every stranger is an invited guest. The Bedouin Arab today still sits out inside his tent, waiting for the stranger to come along, for him to offer his hospitality to and welcome them as a guest. In Genesis 18, 2-7, Abraham's example to the three strangers who came up, walking up to his tent was exactly this hospitality. He was enthusiastic to receive his guests, so he ran after them. He hastened to Sarah in the tent to get her to get the food ready. And then he ran to the herd to find the calf and get, got it ready to dress it. He was eager to humbly serve the stranger or the guests with food water, rest and protection. So in the Middle Eastern tent, when you first arrived, if you're a guest, you would be given a drink of cold water. 
This would mean that you were being recognised to be worthy of a peaceful reception. Jesus is our living water. If you're a guest of a Middle Eastern host, do not expect to be left alone. Their culture is the opposite to us. I would probably like to have my own space, but in a Middle Eastern tent, that doesn't happen. Because if you were left alone in a tent like this, you were, were to be considered ill-treated. And this even went as far as sleeping at night. There was no need for privacy because you slept in the clothes you came in. And the host and his sons would sleep with them. And if you had to send the guest upstairs for room, then the host would send his sons up there to sleep with him. He will never leave us or forsake us. The height, the centre point of, of hospitality in the Middle Eastern culture is the meal. The sharing of food was a very special act of making a covenant with your guest, a covenant of peace and fidelity. And this reminds me of what Pastor Harry shared last week when the, men, the people and Moses were making a covenant with God and the people sat and ate and drank and the blood was sprinkled over the people. It also reminds us of communion. We come together in a new covenant with Jesus. And the thing is here, if we remember, that he becomes the meal. He's the centre point. It's his blood. It's his flesh that becomes our meal because of what he had done for us and what we remember with him. There is a Middle Eastern expression, bread and salt. So when it is said, there is bread and salt between us, it is the same thing as saying we are bound together in a solemn covenant. Jesus is the bread and we are the salt of the earth. We come together. Jesus' hospitality, we can read about it in Luke 14, 13. He said, when you hold a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. This is what Jesus was doing when he went about healing, creating miracles and teaching. He was offering an invitation to the poor, the brokenhearted, the captive, the blind and the oppressed. He was offering an invitation to come under his tent. We're going to go down to verse 20, 28 in the story. For she thought, if I just touch his clothing, I will be well. Immediately, her flow of blood was dried up and she felt in her body and knew without a doubt that she was healed of her suffering. Immediately, Jesus, recognising him in himself that the power had gone out for him, turned around and asked, who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around and you ask who touched you? Still, he kept looking around to see the woman who had done it. What was it about the garment of the Lord that she had such faith that if Jesus was really the Messiah, that she would receive healing if she touched it? In Numbers 15, 38 to 39, it says, Speak to the people of Israel and tell them to make tassels on the corner of their garments throughout their generations and put a cord of blue on the tassel of each corner. And it shall be a tassel for you to look at and to remember all the commandments of the Lord and to do them, not to follow after your own heart and your own eyes, which you're inclined to whore after. Okay.
Okay, so this, yes, yep, and um, this is what was talked about in Numbers 15, where they are meant to have these tassels here to remind them of the commandments of God and to do them because we need reminding. We need those physical reminders all the time. So the next scripture, can you leave it on for a second? Is that okay? Okay. The next, okay. So these tassels, the word for that is kanaf, the borders, the corners of his robe. Okay. In Malachi 4.2, there is a prophecy about Jesus saying, But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. Now the word wings is kanaf too. It's the same, same meaning, same word. Thank you, excuse my name. So often we see Jewish men at the wall. Okay? And they even hide under it. Okay. Well, yeah. So, what what does this remind you of? What is he under? A tent and a covering under a tent. So that's the picture. And this woman came along and took hold one of these. Thank you, Pastor Harry, for that. Okay. And on the on the on the shawl, it said. Blessed are you, Lord God of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to wrap ourselves with tzitzit. Okay. Now, so healing. The rabbis taught that the Messiah would come with healing in his wings. And some of the rabbis made their tzitzits, those, those things hanging down there, very very long to make them look more holy than other people okay but this is also representative of a person's authority and if a person dies they cut these off when David cut the corner of Saul's cloak this is what he was cutting off he's saying I'm not killing you I'm cutting off your authority so that's what it meant in Jewish culture. So when this woman reached out to the hem of his garment, it was more than a brush along with his material, like all the other people were doing. No, she was reaching out in faith to his authority and to take hold of his wings, his healing presence. Instead of contaminating the tabernacle of God, she was given access to his cleansing power and set free by his presence, his mercy and grace radiated to her. Verse 33. And the woman, though she was afraid and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came down and fell before him and told him the whole truth. She was caught. I can imagine she was thinking, I'm going to do this on the quiet. No one's going to know who I am because I'm unclean. I shouldn't be here. So I'm just going to come behind, touch him, touch this cord, and then he'll heal me. And that's all it needs to be. All the feelings of rejection and alienation, living the way she had, would have been, she would have been worried that the rest of the crowd would stone her because she was committing uh, against the ceremonial law at that time. But instead, what did Jesus say to her? He said, verse 34, Daughter, your faith, your personal trust and confidence in me has restored you to health. Go in peace, be permanently healed, from your suffering. Jesus valued her far more than ceremonial constraints. He receives her. He is her protector rather than her accuser. Middle Eastern hosts, when they take in a guest, they are taking in the person who they will protect against enemies. 
That is their role. In Psalm 23, 5, David says, feeling utterly secure because he knows his, his Lord is with him and in his host, he says, thou prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He knows he is safe because the Lord God is his host. Psalm 91 says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, under his wings you will find refuge. This woman had come in shame and under the old covenant she had no access to God in the tabernacle or the temple because she was unclean. But instead Jesus comes saying in Matthew 11 28 to 29 come to me all who labour and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I can't imagine a person more heavy laden and more imprisoned who had suffered 12 years of sickness, rejection and alienation and despair and loneliness to be like a leper to her family and friends but she reached out in faith to Christ, to the one who tabernacles with us, to his hospitality, to his baptism, to his banquet in the kingdom of God. So today, today, Lord, the Lord is offering us an invitation, access to him. He wants our company. He wants to spend time with us. He wants to dwell with us. That is his heart. And if we're already under the tent, let's spend that time with him. We don't need to wait. We need to come just in front of him in his presence and his presence is in, in with us. All of us were strangers, yet he opened up his tent of glory to us after expectantly watching us walk down a very dusty, dirty road. He extended a welcome of forgiveness and love and mercy and grace. Our feet were grimy with dirt, so he took off our shoes and washed our feet. He gives us clean clothes, robes of righteousness to wear. He is our Jehovah you. He offers us a glass of cool, refreshing water. He kills the fatted calf and prepares a meal to eat with us in covenant. He is our Jehovah Jireh. He heals our diseases. He is our Jehovah Rapha. And he protects us from the enemy. He is our Jehovah Nissi. He neither slumbers or sleeps while we are at rest. He is our Jehovah Shalom. He never leaves us alone. He is with us always. He is our Jehovah Ra. He is our companion. God is still the same. In Psalm 24, 3 to 4, it says, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. If we accept his invitation, we are made clean of sin and given access through the death and resurrection of his beloved son so that we can live freely in his presence, his glory and under his tent. And why does he do this? Because he loves us. It has always been his heart to dwell with us and live with us and be in us. Thank you, Lord God, because of your mercy and your grace, and it's nothing that we have done. 
that we can come into your tent and receive your mercy, your forgiveness, your protection, your meal and all your love. Thank you, Jesus. You've been listening to a message from Momentum Church. To get in touch, visit our website, momentumchurch.com.au or search Momentum Church Gold Coast on Facebook. Facebook.